This week on Behind the Pulpit. Today we are pleased to welcome on one of our world partners and friend of the show, Clint Watkins. He was our guest preacher on the parable of the wicked tenants yesterday, and we will talk about his sermon in depth. Jesus' parables get more clear the closer he gets to Jerusalem. Mm. He's purposely veiling some of them earlier on in his ministry, but because he's approaching his death, Mm. he's like, there's no need to veil this anymore. He doesn't want anybody to mistake what he's saying. Like, if you reject me, it will not go well for you. And he doesn't want any any room for interpretation of what he means by that. But before we get to the sermon, we take the time to extensively discuss the assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump and the events and circumstances that surround it. Oh, there is uh, one news story that uh, has been making the rounds this, uh, this weekend, and perhaps you've heard of it. There was an assassination attempt on former... President Trump on Saturday night in in Butler, Pennsylvania, at one of his rallies. From a political perspective, it was it filled me with dismay that this is where we are right now. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean we all know that we're polarized, but I don't think that we were thinking that we were going to be into the phase of political violence. Wherever you may be watching or listening to this today, we hope you're having a wonderful day. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's edition of Behind the Pulpit. Well, hey there. Welcome for, to Behind the Pulpit for, um, what is today? July 15th, 2024. We're glad that you're joining us. My name is Bob Irving. I'm one of the pastors here at NBC. If this is your first time watching us, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a like. Yeah, leave a comment. We'd love to interact with you. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague way over here to my far left. I finally found the Millington Baptist Church polos. You did. Represented last week. I Check said it to, out, guys. Today, I was We're, glad. Uh, rocking the logo right I considered here. wearing. Tree. I considered wearing mine today, but then I thought, you know what? I should do the Venture Church Network, our denomination, and I'm glad because now we're we're complementing each other. We're like two sides of the same coin. We're like salt and pepper, man. You're the macro you level go. infrastructure. I'm the micro level infrastructure. Am I salt and your pepper because of the colors? Yeah. Let's go with that. All right. That should be the title of today's episode, Salt and Pepper. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Well, sandwiched in between us is uh, Clint Watkins right here. What what would you be? Salt and Pepper? What's in between Salt and Pepper? I feel like I have Salt and Pepper. I'm like the combination <laughs> of you two and my beard. Right. There you go. There you go. of the beard. My awesome. shirt, too, is Salt and Pepper. Awesome. Well, good job. Well, Clint, we're glad it's you're here today. Maturity. Um, if you're if you're joining us, we usually try to have a guest on and, and do a little bit of interviewing with them. Uh, Clint, why are you here today? Well, I'm a world partner of Millington, so a missionary with a ministry called Disciple Makers, and I was guest preaching yesterday, so had the pleasure of filling the pulpit for you guys. Which you did, and you, f- you filled it. Uh, you filled it quite well. Um, and we're going to talk about your sermon a little bit later in the in the message, and maybe once we get there, you can fill us in a bit about your ministry. Uh, you did a little bit from the pulpit yesterday, but we'll give you give you some air time. Cool. Um, so, Pastor Dave, how was your weekend? Do anything fun this weekend? My weekend was great. I uh, enjoyed some hot New Jersey weather. We did a little walking. I had a uh, 13th birthday party for my niece, and I uh, mowed the lawn. I uh, went to church. Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. Good for you. <laughs> my wife and I went on our first date in quite some time. We saw um, Fly Me to the Moon, Okay, which was, uh, which was a r- rather fun movie. We were actually trying to get out and see the movie Sound of Hope, which is about the adoption um, theme. And unfortunately, it's got a limited release, so we could not find a time that worked for us. Uh, or a theater that was like super close, so we saw that, and that was uh, that was a lot of fun. But um, did you recover from VBS? Ah, uh, yes, we did. Ha- good point. We did have VBS this weekend, and and I did. I got to nap a, a little bit. Um, I'm always amazed at VBS uh, at how you you can do it for like three hours a day, and yet feel like you work for eighty hours for the week. <laughs> Um, even though you actually maybe worked 15. We packed the house this week. There was 167 registered kids and uh, 15 professions of faith on Gospel Day. So sharing the good news, shout out to the volunteers. I think there was 100 volunteers who helped us wow. put scuba on this year, diving deep into friendship with God. Thanks, Rachel and Lenore, for your leadership. VBS was a huge success. We usually don't use the balcony for the kids, and this year the whole sanctuary was full, balcony and all. So it was a great time and a wonderful opportunity for ministry. So Millington is doing some great things this summer. 
Yeah, thanks for that highlight there. It was it was a wonderful week. Um, I enjoyed it. Tim put together a wonderful recap video yesterday. Tim, man, that e video. everybody was counting one, two, three, four. Uh, although nobody could count above four, so I'm I'm a little concerned <laughs> their math skills. Yeah, I like doing. I did that something similar last year, um, where you take one of the songs that has this like repeating mm. item and mm -hmm. have all the volunteers do something funny and get them in the video a little bit. So that was the yeah. only song that really had that. So we were counting. Well, that was fun to see all the volunteers up there doing doing something and capturing um, the, the 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 sea of people we had helping us uh, this week. So that was I that see was what really you did wonderful. there. I did. You know, actually, I did it unintentionally. I forgot that it was a it was a, a sea scuba underwater theme, but uh, but it was a wonderful wonderful week. So, um, hey, uh, we are going to jump into our in the news segment because we got some things to talk about. So let's go to in the news. All right, so there is uh, one news story that uh, has been making the rounds this uh, this weekend, and perhaps you've heard of it. Um, it, it is a rather somber one. So uh, Pastor Dave uh, alluded to this in our service yesterday. There was an assassination attempt on former President Trump on Saturday night in, in Butler, Pennsylvania, at one of his rallies. And, uh, you know, even today there's still news and, and um, things that are coming in to help shed some light on exactly what happened. Um, but it, it is a, a, a very sobering moment that this uh, happened in the United States. Um, last time there was a presidential assassination was Ronald Reagan back in 1981, the year I was born. Uh, that was crazy to think it's been that long ago. Um, but I, I don't know where you were. I, I was, uh, um, as I was alluding to, my wife and I were on this date. After we were done watching the movie, we went out and got some dinner. And, uh, and she said somebody texted her that um, Trump was shot. And so we watched the footage of this, and it was, pretty, pretty, it was a pretty surreal thing. Um, produced some emotions uh, within me. And um, the first thing I thought after it was done, well, uh, well I thought two things. Number one, um, somebody didn't do their job which has been a lot of stuff rolling in on, on the Secret Service uh, issues and security issues for this event, how somebody could have gotten so close with a rifle uh, to a presidential candidate. And then uh, secondly, uh, one of the things I think we haven't experienced um, in, in this day and age is, is having something like this happen uh, with our new video technology. And if things had moved just slightly differently, uh, we literally could have had an assassination um, happen in high definition, uh, and it could have been very, very, very gruesome. So um, thank God that didn't happen, but there was still loss of life. There was a lot of tragedy that happened. Um, uh, one man in particular, this Corey, um, how do you say his last name? Comparatory? Com Comparatory? Um, fireman uh, jumped on top of his family, uh, protecting them, saving them from these stray bullets. Uh, other people were injured, and uh, it was... Um, it was a moment, and you know some images that are coming out already that I think people will will remember for for a while, um, no matter where you are on this political spectrum. I don't know where were you, Pastor Dave? Clint, feel free to weigh in on this. I don't know when, when you heard about this. Yeah, I was hanging out with my brother-in-law, and then there started to be these notifications on my phone and uh, text threads, and I just was shocked. I was really in disbelief for a few minutes there. It was yeah. um, very sad and i was grateful that it wasn't um a successful assassination attempt we can all be thankful for that although it's extremely sad that that someone else had passed away as a result of this yeah um i think from a um political perspective it was it filled me with dismay that this is where we are right now i mean, mm -hmm. I mean we all know that we're polarized but i don't think that we were thinking that we were going to be into the phase of political violence and so that felt very um that felt very dark and very heavy that, mm -hmm. that this is happening. So of course, as a Christian, uh, as a pastor, I'm thinking this is a murder attempt. This is a violation of God's law. No matter where you stand mm -hmm. in your political affiliation, it's an attack an on attack the image, image of God itself, on the image mm -hmm. of God and uh, subversion of, uh, God's will for someone's uh, right to, to live. And we have no right to, to deny them that right. So, there was some anger mixed in there. There was some sadness, but definitely a lot of shock. Um, it was a, a whirlwind of a weekend. Um, and then coming Sunday morning, I felt like we should acknowledge that in a public way and offer prayer for our nation. Yeah. And um, 
it's it's been a difficult uh, thing to process. Still kind of processing everything that's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I was I was actually in the middle of sermon prep mm. and my wife texted me uh, and I'm glad she did cuz I actually had to remove an illustration from my sermon because it was, <laughs> you know, we, you, yeah. you have political and religious tension in the text. So, you know. how many pastors were revising sermons? Right, at or just Saturday Sunday night at seven or six p.m. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of you know, I, I think that yeah. all of us thought, okay, how how, mm-hmm. how do I address this pastorally? And I thought you did a good job. Um, I had the same response of sadness. Uh, I'm not like a Honestly, politics like exhaust me. I'm pretty, yeah. especially these days. Yeah. I'm more mm. tempted to just like pull out and mm. um, more prone towards apathy. But I was sad, mm. like just that's where our country's at, and yeah. to think that that's that's kind of where where we've come to. Yeah, yeah. And I think our our <clears throat> what I also thought is well, we're at this really interesting uh, political moment, and I think you're right. I think Christians really struggle with it. Uh, should I engage? How do I engage? Um, I do think there's a lot of important issues, and it's it's important to be part of the political process, mm-hmm. uh, certainly as individuals and voting, um, advocating for for uh, certain things. Um, one of the things I think from a from a Christian perspective that is that is uh, has been continually disturbing, and we've done a number of underground sessions on this issue, is this this civil discourse, this. Uh, lack of the way that we speak. And in the New Testament talks a lot about um, our speech and how that should be um, characterized, how we should treat others who are made in the image of likeness of God. And uh, a lot of people have been dismayed by how uh, the cultural and really political discourse has gone with this. And we're we're starting to see some of that ramping up. You know, for a moment, um, uh, I think people were saying the right things. uh, And and I'm hopeful that there'll there'll be a change in terms of how we treat uh, people that disagree with us, but the um, the constant talk about how people that are on the other side are evil, uh, the demonization um, is 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 concerning. And, and now that we've gotten to this point of now we, now we have a shooter trying to trying to kill people, um, hopefully that will wake some people up to think we sh- we should debate but not demonize. Um, and uh, there's a a very yeah. specific exhortation from the Lord Jesus about this. And, you know, he talks about how we should be careful with our speech, but further, he actually t- commands us to love not just our neighbors, but to love our enemies. Mm. And so that would, of course, include our political enemies, those who mm-hmm. vehemently disagree with us on platform issues. Uh, we're called to a higher standard. We're called to transcend the kind of vitriol, the kind of demonization that we see from the world's perspective. And, I think we can speak out against uh, moral issues and speak out against um, you know things that are evil, but at the same time, uh, we have to remember that God's call for us uh, as Christians in Romans chapter twelve is to actually bless uh, our enemies, and mm-hmm. this is heaping burning coals on their head, and this is this is the way in which God calls his his people to live. That's hard to do, especially when you really disagree and literally bullets are flying uh but yet this is the the higher call of christ in this moment so Mm -hmm. i think that's what's going to bring us unity um there's been some uh difficult things this weekend but i think our our higher calling is to remember that we are christ's people and he he calls us to love our enemies yeah well and in terms of the rhetoric thing i mean so james 3 talks about how life and death are in the power of the tongue right Mm. so um our words do matter in terms of how we crouch them. Now, again, it's not to debate. And even with the term unity, I think we have to be careful. Like, there's some things that we, you know, we're going to disagree about. So let's be clear about, you know, there's some things we can unify on. There's some things that we can disagree about. But um, one, I think hopefully one thing we can all agree on is that all people are um, image bearers and we should treat them with uh, respect. Uh, I think like you're, get, you're getting at right there. Yeah, I think, you know, I guess what, what can we, what can we specifically condemn here? You have seen some statements that are really careless. Um, you know, we live in the age of social media, so people just type yeah. stuff and they post stuff and they a lot of people TikTok have videos. posted things and took them down yeah. already. So you I think some people lost their jobs because I, of what I, they posted? I, I read mm. some statements yeah. that were really um, concerning. Like people were saying, you know, how do you miss a shot like that? Hmm. Like, I, I don't know what place you need to be in uh, vit- <laughs> vilifying your political enemy to make a statement like that so mm-hmm, that the public mm-hmm. like 
So that kind of thing, I think we should, you know, condemn outright. That's just not good. Um, so, you know, let's be really care- careful with our words. I don't know what it is about being behind a screen and being behind this this sort of structure that we built in our society that yeah. causes us to act like this. Maybe there's sort of an anonymity that we think is there, or uh, we need to be we need to do better. So. Yeah, is, is this part of a larger system where the, the, between social media and the way and and the 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 breakdown of institutions? I've heard a lot of people write about that. Mm-hmm. That w- what. In terms of unity, what what are, what are the areas of of life that are bringing us together? Less people are going to church. That was a major institution previously. Uh, nobody trusts the government. Um, a lot of civic you know institutions have gone away. So w- where are we connecting in American life? Are we just kind of retreating back behind our phones and our screens and then sending out thoughts <laughs> for yeah. all, for all to read for all time yeah. without without any editing? You know. Right, uh, and you gave an example of that, but there was others. So, you know, uh, to quote Fred Rogers, um, graduate of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, by the way, Mister Rogers, uh, when he would talk about seeing traumatic and horrific events in the news, he would say, "Look for the heroes." Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to take a look at this this guy's behavior, this particular father, and I'll just read a little bit about. Uh, Mm -hmm. what he did. So yeah, Corey Comparatori, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not totally sure, but 50 years old. um, He's got a wife and daughters Mm -hmm. and in a split second, I mean, history could have, could have really gone very differently, um, but it did go very differently for this family in a split second. His first reaction as a husband and as a father was to literally shield the rest of his family from, um, this danger and he lost his life in the process. Uh, and so there's a GoFundMe out there for, um, his children. And the goal was $7,000. Uh, right now, last time I checked this morning, it was over $800,000 in donations Mm. to this family. Uh, because I think what we're seeing there is that's the storyline underneath of history that we all know is the better story. Mm -hmm. The, the story of this is, this is the way that we're made in God's image to serve, to protect, to humbly give our lives uh, in service of others and in, to protect our loved ones. Uh, that was a, a wonderfully inspiring moment to see w- what this dad did. Um, and I, I pray for his family and pray for his, his daughters. But a uh, sad mm. story, terrible story, but yet a heroic story that's worthy of um, highlighting and celebrating. So Fred yeah. Rogers... Look for the heroes. There was a hero there that day. Yeah, uh, and so we honor Corey for for yeah. his um, bravery. That's wonderful. And um, you know, the flip side of that, of course, is now his family is without him, and they're going to deal with grief and suffering. And Clint, we didn't have it in the in, uh, a book segment, but <laughs> I know you in, in your back pocket always have a book that you could bring, and you wrote a book on such. A, uh, a topic on how to deal with grief and suffering and maybe you could share a bit about that and what would you yeah. say to this family as, as a result of what you've learned is there is there some applicable truths well more so just putting myself in their shoes uh, all of the the rhetoric out there and all of the the you know news responses they're grieving the loss of their father and husband you know so mm-hmm who knows for for years to come like they're going to be reminded in all different ways of the loss of their their dad i mean they're i'm sure there's going to be a mix of wow look at what he did and celebrating his heroism but he's not here because i mean they could they could make the argument because of the political division and all of the uh you know the animosity that they lost their dad in the midst of it yeah. so i remember thinking something similar when uh kobe bryant when he mm-hmm. died, yeah, there yeah. were many the others. Crash. There were yeah. many others who died in that crash, mm-hmm. but like, it makes sense that Kobe Bryant got all mm-hmm. a lot of the attention. He's a huge celebrity, mm-hmm. but then these other people kind of faded into anonymity yeah. when they also lost loved ones. Mm-hmm. And it's just hard. I can imagine being in a very tough position as this family. That yeah. grieving the loss of their dad would be hard enough just in isolation, but that it's connected to all this political tension. It's just going to amplify their, their grief. So yeah. my yeah. advice to them would be the title of my book to just be honest and, mm. uh, 
wrestle with, I don't know where they're at with the Lord, but to wrestle with what they're experiencing. And it sounded like he had a faith, so I assume the other family members did too. Yeah. Yeah. And even they quoted him as going to church regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I haven't really done it. I think I, I, I saw that, the phrase, he loved this. Jesus. Oh, you so. did? Mm. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of people celebrating his sacrifice, which is great. They're going to be grieving his loss. Um, right. So even that's going to be hard. Like everyone's going to want to find the silver lining and like, look at what your dad did. And it's like, yeah, but it shouldn't have happened. Right. Like there should not have been a shooter. Right. Uh, so yeah, I just, I feel for them. It's going to be a hard, yeah. Several months and years for them. I think maybe the last thing to mention about this, uh, from a, from a Christian worldview is when moments like this happen, um, you know, we long for, um, the day when it will be no more for the new heavens and the new earth. And from, from the, I guess, from the political perspective, um, it's a reminder that, uh, we need a better, a better King Mm -hmm. that one day our true King will come. Um, you know, as we've been reading in Luke, there's a lot of eschatological themes and, uh, in a couple weeks, not this week, but the week after, uh, we're going to be talking specifically about that. Um, you know, the end of history where it's moving, and one day Jesus will come back and he will reign, and as John tells us in the end of Revelation, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will pass away. And so in the midst of this, uh, Christians look forward with a hope and uh, await uh, our Savior who's going to return. Can I share a um, public prayer from the Book of Common Prayer? Absolutely. I thought this was really good. Um, Sometimes I struggle with the words to pray in a moment like this pastorally, so it's tremendously uh, helpful to me to see how others have thought through prayers in these moments. I thought this one was particularly good as I was thinking about um, the right words. Uh, It says this in the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure conduct. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace Mm -hmm. at home, Mm -hmm. and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth." In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness. And in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a good word. And maybe we should conclude our In the News segment right there. Sounds good. All right, Clint, why don't we head back to you? Uh, You preached yesterday, and you continued our Luke series. Um, We'd love to talk about that, maybe before... We kind of get into the nitty gritty of the sermon. Tell us a bit about um, your organization, what you do, um, and how we can learn more about it. Yeah, so I work for Disciple Makers. It's the uh, the campus ministry that God used to to recapture me when I was in college. Mm-hmm. I was uh, on my way away on, from Jesus on, on the road <laughs> to ruin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was leaving when I left MBC. I was on my way to Tarshish. Is the how I mm. uh, talk about it? Um, Where did you go to school? Muhlenberg. Okay. It's in Allentown. Mm-hmm. Um, so, That's yeah. Like Tarshish. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it. So I, uh, yeah, I was just really affected in a good way by discipleship. Um, God used some faithful men to to pour into me, to minister the gospel to me, and I was just compelled by that uh, vision to go deep in discipleship, mm-hmm. and in particular with college students. So ever since I graduated in 2012, I have worked for Disciple Makers, and um, I spend my time teaching, preaching, discipling students on mm. secular campuses and uh, seeing the gospel go forward in really cool ways. Mm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Did they awesome. uh, minister to you right there out of the gate freshman year, or did that take a couple years for you to get involved with that? Or um, So my oldest brother, Justin, who I talked about yesterday in the sermon, uh, he helped me move in, and he saw a poster mm-hmm. in my dorm hall, like advertising to site makers. And I wanted nothing to do with a Christian group, but mm. I was kind of paying my dues. My dad was a youth pastor. My older brother was going to be a youth pastor, and he was saying, hey, you should go check that out. So I, I made the mistake of signing up at the activities fair, mm-hmm. and that put a target on my back. From the, They're mm-hmm. like, oh, a pastor's kid signed up. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's just go keep knocking on his door. When can uh, you preach for us? And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 
Um, but like, it wasn't until. You don't until, know who you're talking to. Would you like I'm to come? I'm the guy with the matches and the, yeah. and the, the airsoft gun. <laughs> would you like to come and share your testimony? <laughs> <laughs> I think I did tell that SWAT story pretty, because that was like a month after it happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I pretty much ghosted the the fellowship for the first year. There's a couple of tough conversations I had with the staff worker where he was uh, actually. Did one of you preach on the Pharisee and the tax collector? I, I did. Yeah. Did he mm-hmm. used that? That oh, was okay. like a that was a pivotal parable for me because mm. he used that to to show my arrogance, my pride, and he's like, God opposes this. Mm. Uh, now he had taken a long time to get to know me, but. Um, that wasn't the first thing. Yeah, that wasn't the first conversation. <laughs> I've got a parable uh, for you, yeah. Clint. <laughs> hey, freshman, welcome to campus. Now it was more towards the end of the year, and that Pharisee was one of the conversations. Freshman. Yeah, right. That was one of the conversations that actually was a life changing conversation for me because oh, it was cool. a, it was a pivotal moment of which way am I going to go with this whole Jesus thing. So it was my sophomore year that I feel like I was really coming around, and ironically, even though I was trying to avoid going into ministry because of my dad and brothers, I ended up going into ministry. Yeah, but. Isn't that sometimes yeah. what happens that we we have these moments in our life that uh, we're taking turns away from God and then God brings us back and then he plops us right back into a very similar environment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where we were freshmen mm-hmm. and we remember what it was like to be these incoming students and we have a special burden, a special mm-hmm. heart for that particular group of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just like God to do that. Yeah. So yeah. here you are about to see a new uh, class of freshmen coming yeah. in next month and see and, how the Lord uses And them. to your point, actually one of the first guys mm-hmm. I, I ever discipled, he became a Christian through our ministry. He was a freshman college athlete running from the Lord, wanted to party in school, and, and that's, what, that, that's what I was. Uh, and he's become a really close friend, and right. uh, he became a Christian and then has been mm-hmm. a disciple maker ever since. So, yeah. L- literally, not just a... Yeah. Yeah. Part of the group. Not, not part of the group. Like he's making <laughs> disciples. Um, Good. So, isn't it great to be able to say to a person like that, like, I like I understand. Like mm-hmm. I can relate to you maybe more than anybody else in here. Mm-hmm. Like I totally empathize yeah. and I get where you're coming from. And that bridge um, relationally serves as a, a a great place to start with yeah. a relationship. So yeah. that's yeah. cool. Yeah. You know the thing I was thinking about yesterday when we. Uh, the missions team was having lunch with you, uh, and at some some point in there, we started talking about college students and how that's such a, a pivotal age range because a lot of people start questioning mm-hmm. their faith, no matter what they were growing up with. And it makes sense. I mean, I remember back in college, in in those eighteen to twenty two year um, that that time span, everything you're constantly changing. You know, the, nothing seems kind of set. You're, you're if at least if you go the traditional route. You, all of a sudden you're thrust out from your parents' house and you're in a dorm with all these new people, everything's new, and you're there for four months and then you come home and then you're kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're, you're kind of displaced. And, and, and as well as, you know, just physically and psychologically you're trying to figure out who you are. It, it is a, a pivotal time where um, Satan can really come in and, and take you on the wrong path. Mm-hmm. You know, we heard a great testimony uh, from, from Michael uh, as baptism yesterday that the, you point alluded back to to illustrate that. Mm-hmm. But he's not the only one. Right. You know, you got a story. I think we all have um, stories to some extent. It's not it's not easy years. Mm-hmm. And so the work that you're doing, uh, I think, is really crucial to, uh, to help the next generation continue to follow the Lord. Um, so I say that as an exhortation, but <laughs> maybe also, do you find that to be true? Oh yeah, um, th- I mean that's why I'm still with disciple makers. I think it's it's a pivotal time for everyone who are who's in college, and so we're you know we're ministering to kids who grew up in the church and are you have kids who grew up in the church and they want to stick with it. You have kids who grew up in the church and they want nothing to do with it anymore. And then mm. you have the rest of society who doesn't know Jesus, and so we're trying to minister to all types of people. Um, but it's also really strategic. Yeah. I mean, the 18 to 22 year olds, the college uh, campus is the next generation of leaders and politicians and business owners. Right, and right, so right. we find it to be a very strategic uh, holdout for the gospel. If we can get them with the gospel, then we can help change the culture and the future. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, so back to the sermon. You did preach <laughs> yesterday, Luke chapter 20. Uh, the last parable in in the gospel, and uh, 
Can you give us a quick summary and tell us what, what was something that was surprising as you started to study that um, that you hadn't realized before you got into it? Yeah, thanks for assigning me that that passage, guys. Yeah. Hey, we've got, we've had some other. I have feel no sympathy. I've had to deal yeah, with some true. difficult texts. You've had some tough along ones. the way. Well, did I tell you what I'm preaching at my home church uh, next month? No. It's Matthew 18, let, the, the unforgiving servant. Yeah. So I'm like, what are my passages? Let, let me let me tell yeah. let me tell you something. Clint. You're a wicked, unforgiving tenant <laughs> servant. And we need you to learn these things. That's, that's also, you're thought. a Pharisee okay. in Luke 18. <laughs> we, we did, just we, kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm going to repent. No. We yeah. preached through Ezra and Nehemiah in the fall. Ooh. And I was assigned the end of Ezra. <clears throat> and let me tell you, if you have not read that recently, go back and read it. And I had to turn that into a sermon. <laughs> so I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> that was one of the funnier sermon run-throughs. Bob shows up for the sermon run-through and he's like, I don't know, guys. I, I don't know what to do with this. So bear with me. <laughs> Well, yeah, just a brief, a brief <laughs> That's the recap. one where he told everybody to divorce their wives. Yeah, divorce oh, all your wives, yeah. kill a bunch of people, yeah. Well, that's fun. All right, all right. No sympathy, I get it. seemed to say divorce was the right way to go. So. Um, yeah, so a brief recap. I mean, the main point that I got to for, for what Jesus is doing in Luke 20 is that God will bring to ruin those who reject his son. Mm. Um, I mean, he's, he's really clear. It's not, a, it's not one of those parables that are a head scratcher. It's like... Um, and actually what I heard in, in just my studies, I think it was maybe from Bible project is that mm -hmm. Jesus's parables get more clear the closer he gets to Jerusalem. Mm. Um, like he's purposely veiling some of them earlier on in his ministry, but because he's approaching his death, mm. he's like, there's no need to veil this anymore. And also what I yeah. was struck by me is when it comes to not minor things in the kingdom, but like stewardship and all that, like there seems to be more at stake for Jesus when it comes to how do you respond to him? Like, so he, he doesn't want anybody to mistake what he's saying. Like, if you reject me, it will not go well for you. And he doesn't want any, any room for interpretation of what he means by that. Um, even that, uh, in verse 18, that he's not just going after the religious leaders. He says, everyone, this is for everyone. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that just packs a punch. Like, you think I'm just talking to the corrupt religious leaders? No, this is a warning for anyone and everyone. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough passage, not not to understand what he was saying, but more so like, wow, this is a weighty, this is a weighty text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, and just so speaking about the clarity of it, so verse 19 of chapter 20, where we're going to pick up next week, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable, the one you preached, against them. But they feared the people. So mm -hmm. them fighting know. words. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yep. uh, let's just say the tension will have ratcheted to to twenty twenty four <laughs> levels next week. Yes, <laughs> true. It's such an understatement, isn't yeah. it? They yeah. perceived that that like, hello. <laughs> yeah, right. They were like, uh, he's he's talking about me. I feel like you might be. <laughs> saying something about us. Am I, are we reading you correctly here? Mm -hmm, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yes. You got a problem with me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thought the Isaiah 5 yeah. connection was so fascinating. I would have loved to spend like a half an hour, like, let's read Isaiah 5 and, and notice it, notice the differences, but that Jesus would take a parable from the Old Testament that especially the chief priests and scribes would have been familiar with. And he's like, hey, I'm going to put you into the story mm -hmm. and make you the problem. Like that was just, I found that uh, fascinating on Jesus' part that he, he's going he's gonna to make it abundantly clear, especially for people who knew their, their Bibles. So, yes. Yeah. Good. He's not so, afraid to pull Although punches. it was a hard parable, there was a lot of grace uh, that you pulled out in three different ways with three Ps, by the way, like a good... Baptist preacher, you have it's you, man. God's grace and His patience, His protection, and in His plan. The Lord's so, favor has smiled upon you. It's actually four. Oh, there were, see, payment. I gotta pay better. It was still alliteration, Pastor Dave. <laughs> but he only had two main points, so it evened out, I guess. Yeah, four Ps. Yeah, <laughs> the payment was I can't really. Help it. Yeah, that was something I wanted to talk about later. So, you talked about how it's not unloving to rebuke or to warn someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that our culture struggles with, that how could this be in any way, shape, or form perceived as loving? Mm -hmm. But yet Christ is the embodiment of God's love. He's the great personification of God's love. And it is not in any way unloving for him to say, this is going to 
be terrible for you if you reject your only hope, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the illustration you gave reminded me of my own children running in the street because my youngest daughter, Felicity, just was <laughs> in love with the street. So, uh, like, Daddy, can I, I like, go play in the street? Felicity, you cannot do that, you know? And I would get angry. I mean, one time you're like scared, but a couple times you're like, we've talked about this. Mm-hmm. you got to stay out of the street. Mm-hmm. Enough is enough, Felicity. Um, and we had one of those those backpacks with the leash on it, you know, that we, we hold her because she was so active. She was so energetic, even in the womb. Like she was always kicking around. This she is like just... my, my, my youngest too. Like she will little be on, on, on shopping carts and will jump out just trusting that I'm going to catch her. Right. It's something with those third kids. Right. <laughs> I mean, you talked about like in your own story, this person in discipleship, disciple makers saying, Hey, this, this behavior that you're exhibiting, uh, is, is going to go bad for you. And mm-hmm. you, you took the rebuke in a way that was profitable mm-hmm. for your soul, right? Mm-hmm. So had that minister of the gospel not given you that warning, that harsh word, the trajectory of your life would have went a very different way. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's helpful for us to be reminded that rebukes are good, mm-hmm. that faithful are the wounds of a friend, that mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's a good thing, that Christ is truthful. Uh, with us because I, I need a swat over the head uh, <laughs> oftentimes. So mm-hmm. um, that was a good reminder to us there. So his grace is seen in many ways. You talked about his uh, patience and how these 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 rent collectors came multiple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, three times was it before mm-hmm. he sent the son? Yeah. Yep. I never had thought about that before, but the prophets were sent over and over and over and of course, they reject them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're characterized by not listening, yeah. by slaughtering the, yeah. the prophets, right? So you do see God's patience here, even in a very difficult parable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is sort of climactic. But I wanted you to talk about this last one, the payment, the fourth P. So uh, <laughs> tell us how you got there and, and what that meant to you in terms of uh, how the gospel really got woven into even even this parable. Yeah. Um, can I do a side note real yeah, please, quick? Yeah. I, was, <clears throat> I was actually thinking of you guys as I was thinking of the servants in the, the parable, that the work of being a messenger of the Lord mm. is, is a hard job because there are times where you have to say things that people don't want to hear, but you're doing it in love. I actually, um, I probably should have, but I was, I was toying with giving an application to the congregation to really receive, uh, God's messengers, even when, mm. even when a hard truth is spoken. So just to commend you guys, it's not, it's a hard oh, job well, to thanks. be a pastor and to bring God's truth don't, and to don't, preach. Don't, don't shake the dust off your feet, you know, <laughs> preach the end of Ezra, you know, and, uh, the tough parable. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, um, position of suffering to minister God's word that, that stood out to me about the messengers. Um, mm. so just to encourage you guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is, it's hard to say that about your own exhortations it seems really right. self-aggrandizing <laughs> and uh like yeah. self-serving yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it helps to come from somewhere yeah. else but like hebrews 13 says like submit to your elders because they watch over your souls right right so and this goes for us too we submit to our elders we have uh we work under authority so mm-hmm. it's good for us to be um underneath of godly leadership uh because that is god's protection of us and so that's helpful so Mm -hmm. um if i'm the kind of pastor that if the elders disagree with me i'm gonna i'm gonna resign or something like that that's not helpful and if (laughs) if if i'm the kind of church member that says well you know i disagree with the leadership so so i'm leaving over something that's not worth leaving over Mm -hmm. like that's a problematic sort of posture Mm -hmm. that um i don't think is is a a godly way to, to participate in the this body. This is one way where a lot of people are getting discipled by the world because we yeah. live in a society where people are taught to critique everything. Everything I'm going to look skeptically at everything I'm going to critique. I'm I'm not quite sure about that. There's not trust. So, it, you know, from from that angle, it makes sense why people do that. But there there is a counter biblical uh, call for mm-hmm. us to for us to follow. Well, and even the pastoral call, like yeah. 2 Timothy three, when. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. It's because people have itching ears and they're going to want to have things that'll make them feel good. And he says, basically, there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to listen to you, but preach the word. So uh, I always just admire the work of of pastors and preachers um, because you guys are doing the faithful work in the pulpit. 
every well, every week. Thank you for that word, Clint. Well, we, we will receive the word from God's <laughs> messenger here this morning. <laughs> yeah, don't beat me up. But what, sorry, that was a tangent. What okay, was your so the, sort of the climactic P, the mm-hmm. one I forgot, the fourth P. The how, climactic. How did you get there? Can that can that be the title of the episode, the climactic P? <laughs> Not gonna lie, I uh, I definitely thought about it there for a hot second. <laughs> so we see grace in his payment. We see grace in in how does that work? Yeah, the I think you had asked how I like where in the text did I get that? Um, I don't know where you guys land on the song "Reckless Love." Um, it that that song has a lot of heat on it, you know. It does yeah. which I understand why because God is not reckless. But oh, the use of the word reckless. Yeah, yeah the, the yeah. use of the word reckless. But the from our perspective, I can understand the use of that word because it it appears reckless, and that's what uh, the parable seems as though the owner is being reckless. He keeps sending these guys who yeah. keep getting beat up, and then he's like, I'm going to send my son in. Here's an idea. Um, I think the concept that he's using in the song is more the extravagant, like mm, a word like that. Yeah. Though, but reckless, you know, kind of sounds yeah. provo- provocative. Yep. Yeah. Um, but it Maybe does... like the, the father in the shooting. Uh, yeah. There's a way in which his behavior could be perceived as reckless because it brought harm to himself. Right. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't reckless for his family he mm-hmm. was very intentional very thoughtful for what how he was going to maneuver himself but in terms of looking out for his own life perhaps that was in a in a, in a, in a way reckless mm-hmm. um, and i'm not i'm not advocating for the use or <laughs> you know uh rejection of that song more so that concept of when you read this parable it seems as though the owner is being reckless mm. he's just sent servants who keep getting beaten up so he's like i'm going to send my son but then realizing like Jesus is telling the story, he's in Jerusalem. He's talking about this story of him being sent and then killed where he is contextually, he has been sent to this place and he's about to be killed. So just recognizing that part of it is the sovereignty of God, but just like the plan of the gospel mm-hmm. was that he was sent in order to die at the hands of violent men. Um, so it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like he was, he was given as a ransom. He was, mm-hmm. he, came to be our payment um so that just struck me more so here's jesus talking about his death he knows he's gonna die it's because he was sent mm-hmm. like that's why that's why he came it wasn't like an accident like oh no the pharisees are gonna kill me he's like nope this is why i came mm. so i owed rent right so i i'm i'm part of this vineyard as 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 a uh, human and um god in his authority has a right to demand fruitfulness of me and I, I refuse his messengers, and I don't have the money to pay. And he's coming collecting in his justice uh, for what really I am obliged to give him, and I, I don't have the means. And so the Son of God takes on humanity, becomes my representative in my place, and pays my rent mm. and all of our rent. Mm-hmm. And that's the good news That's a beautiful way to think about that last part of the parable. Hmm. You use the word reversal. So at the beginning of the parable, you were talking about the word ruin. um, And then you kind of flipped it. You flipped the, the, remind me what you did there. So you started with saying our rejection leads to our ruin Mm -hmm. or something like that. And Mm -hmm. then you flipped it. How did you do it? Oh man. What, how did I do it? (laughs) Uh, That he was ruined so that we could be received. Yeah. So like he, that was another thing. Everyone gets destroyed in the parable, basically. <laughs> Even <laughs> the, the son. The, yeah. The tenants. Like, or the, it's like the end of Macbeth <laughs> <laughs> or Hamlet, right? Yeah. Everybody has the end of Hamlet. The, the servants get beat up. Everybody's dead. The, yeah. Jesus gets killed. The, the tenants get taken out. So it's, it's not a matter of whether or not there will be destruction. It's whose destruction will, will you put your hope in or, like, will you be destroyed yourself because of your rejection, or will you be putting your hope in the destruction and rejection of Jesus? Um, that was, yeah, that was another thing. Like, everyone, everyone's basically dead at the end of this parable, you know? Mm. <laughs> but the vineyard survives because, uh, in the end, Jesus protects it through his death. And gives it to others. Yeah. Yeah, which is, of course, the church mm-hmm. and the leadership of the, the, new, the new covenant community. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting uh, yeah. reversal. One last question. Mm-hmm. Cornerstone? 
So you yeah. referenced it. Um, uh, yep. I there was, was just thinking that. There was two songs our worship director chose um, yesterday with the word cornerstone in it because mm-hmm. of this passage. Our worship director reads the passage <laughs> and and wor- thinks carefully about it. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that mean? That's what is an that, understatement. What does that word does John mean? John think carefully about worship songs. Very. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. So how, how does that word play out in this passage? What's, what's going on with that? I, mm-hmm. I know he's quoting Old Testament stuff, Psalm 118, I think, <clears> but... <throat> How was your understanding of that? Yeah, and I actually, that was one thing, again, I was wrestling with of how much to go into this idea of the cornerstone, because this becomes a <clears throat> a cornerstone of the <laughs> the message of the church. Uh, I think Noah read from Acts 4, yeah. um, mm-hmm. there's salvation to no one else, yep. the cornerstone that's yep. been rejected. It's used in Ephesians 2, it's used in 1 Peter 2, mm-hmm. um, so it's a pretty pivotal uh, idea and concept one of the fun things is I, I read in a commentary that Jesus might be um, doing wordplay that um, stone in Hebrew is Eben and son is Ben. Okay. And so if if it was in Hebrew when he was speaking, um, which I think it was, he's actually doing a wordplay of the stone yeah. and the son. It's kind of I had never heard that before. Um, okay. But that's a... The Greek word that's used here is, is kafale, which mm-hmm. can mean head, like the head of something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, the whole concept of this this stone, they're building a temple or a house, mm-hmm. and they're like, that that stone is worthless. I don't even want it. Uh, the builders reject, which builders could be connected to the tenants. Right. But it's actually the rejected stone that becomes the foundational piece of the whole structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really get into that yesterday. I guess yeah. I, I could have, maybe should have. No, that's okay. No, <laughs> it's just a very interesting thing. It's, it's those who fall on this stone the stone will be destroyed or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then those upon whom this stone drops will be crushed. also yeah. crushed. Yeah. So there's, I guess in what I was reading, I was just listening to your sermon and just reading it. Like, it seems like there's two principles there. Either we can be destroyed by the truth of the gospel and how this demands our, um, you know, humility, or we can be destroyed um, by it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's either we bow the knee uh, in advance and submit to Christ as Lord, or one day he returns as Lord and our knees buckle under his mm-hmm. sovereign judgment. But mm-hmm. either, either way, we're getting destroyed. We're not coming out of this thing. Right. Without, Every without knee being will destro- bow. Yeah. Every knee will bow. Yeah. Yeah. At least that's what the, kind of how I was reading the way it was worded in Luke. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a very wonderful image, and the cornerstone bec- becomes the the one that was rejected becomes the chief cornerstone. Yeah, uh, it is cool to see that that um, that verse from the Psalms becomes a pretty pivotal message for the church. It does. It's, it's Acts, like all over the New Testament. Yeah, it's like one of God's favorite Bible verses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good message, man. Thank you. Thanks for bringing the word. Hard text. Next year we'll give them even harder text. That's right. We decided that Clint's going to be our VBS preacher from now on. (laughs) We don't want to preach the week after VBS. Yeah, that makes it easy for me. I'll just mark my calendar. Usually the second Sunday in July. So you know, perfect. Great. Mark your calendar for next year. I'll I'll put it in my calendar. (laughs) Assuming they don't switch the week, I don't know, but (laughs) we'll see. All right. Well, we've come to the end of the show, and now it's time to do some sprinting. So, uh, Tim, uh, I don't know. Did you give some thought to some questions over there, and then we'll decide who's going to... I did. I had one. You have one for Clint? I had one last week, um, and we didn't do one last week, so I'm going to bring that one back up. So, harken back to last week's passage. Um, some. Uh, I think this has been asked to, to me a few times, and I've seen this on some some online comments and social media portals. Um, we have this nether this, regions of social media. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have this scene in the book of Luke where Jesus is coming into a temple and um, a different gospels say he's overturning tables. And then we have another scene earlier in the gospel in John where he's coming into another temple with a whip and overturning tables. And the question that I see a lot is why was that, how is that not sin? Oh, okay. Do you want to take a crack at that? Since it was your passage or the righteous anger? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the Bible actually um, talks about our um, 
humanity as made in the image of God, and part of that is our emotional makeup. So we have an intellectual side, an emotional side, spiritual side, relational side. I think um, our emotions are given to us by God, and there's uh, nothing inherently sinful about these emotions. It's what we do with them. Like as a father, I say, it's okay for you to be angry to my daughters. It's not okay for you to pick up this chair and throw it at me, but it's okay (laughs) for you to be angry. It's a matter of how you express the anger. You know, like Ephesians 4 says, be angry. It says, be angry and don't sin, but it actually commands us to be angry because there are some things in this world that we're supposed to be angry about, right? So Tim Keller has this famous spectrum where he says, on the one side, there's like a problem with blow anger, and then on the other side, there's a problem with no anger. And then the middle is uh, God's trajectory for us, which is slow anger. And I think uh, either having blow anger where we're escalated and uh, hurtful or having no anger where we're stuffing our emotions and not really being honest or maybe being passive aggressive, that's a problem. But slow anger is the way in which we are um, made to reflect God because that's how he is. Mm. He's slow to anger. But at this point in Jesus' ministry, he comes to the temple for an inspection, finds that they've corrupted God's house, and he becomes angry with righteous indignation. And that's actually okay. Mm -hmm. You guys add anything to that? In the John account, he makes a whip of cords, which takes time. (laughs) So he doesn't actually fly off the handle. There's actually like a, a controlled slow anger yeah. he's not he's not yeah mm. just <laughs> blowing steam and going crazy yeah. no nah, that was a good answer man yeah okay good job well if you want more on uh fully expressing our emotions before <laughs> god and writing your own lament just songs be honest and things like that just be honest man. just be honest by clint watkins since you're plugging can i make a plug it harder John man plug? well not about the book but oh. at the See, you can plug our sermon exhortations and we can plug your book and we'll <laughs> help great. each other this way. Well, another place of Jesus' anger that gets overlooked is at the, the tomb of Lazarus. It says that he's deeply moved. The word there is actually enraged. Mm. Like he's enraged at the reality of death. So there's a place for, for anger towards things that uh, are not meant to be like exploitation of others and, mm-hmm. and death and injustice. Right. Cornelius Plantinga wrote a famous book on sin called not the way it's supposed to be. Mm. And uh, this makes God angry, which mm-hmm. is why he came to offer himself and make it right. Yeah. It's good. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Dave. couple announcements. couple announcements. What do we got, Tim? We got slides or no? Oh, yeah. All right. Put something up there. All right. So I have to say something about this. So Noah got up there uh, August 10th, 7.05. We have the uh, men's ministry. There's going to be some... Um, uh, you know, fireworks at the ballpark. If you're interested in doing that and you're watching, scan that QR code right now and you can go to sign up. Let us know you're coming. Uh, that's going to be a, uh, a fun event, I think. Uh, so I'm always interested at this, this team called the Rumble Ponies, although I believe, uh, depending on where you're from, it's, uh, it's the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. Yeah, I believe Noah might have pronounced Binghamton wrong. Bing, Bing Hampton. <laughs> I mean, but it's like Lancaster, Lancaster. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit of trivia. Does anybody know whose major league ballpark this is in the background of this graphic? It looks like the Yankees, right? The it old is, Yankee it stadium. It is not the Yankees. It's not. I'll give you guys another guess. Uh, Coors Field. It is the home of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Hmm. Ooh. Okay, so don't go that there thinking that's what's going to look a little large like. for the Somerset. Uh, <laughs> I've been to the Somerset Patriots. <laughs> They're now yeah. a minor league team for the Yanks, aren't they? They are. They are the double-A affiliate of the New double York Yankees. Wow. So, boom, there you go. Sign up online. Cool. Number two. Uh, you want to talk about this, Tim? Night of Revival? Sure. Uh, talked a little bit about it last week, but uh, if you guys remember in January, we had a Night of Revival and, uh, where we came together, called in the name of Jesus for Revival, and just had an awesome night of worship, and it was successful. People were like, we should do this every Friday, and we're like, that might be difficult, but we'll do it again, and here it is, uh, 7 p.m. on August 16th. We'd love to see you guys there. If you weren't there, come. If you were there, come back and bring a friend with you. We were trying to bring a lot of people um, to this event. So we've been doing uh, uh, announcing it. There's nothing people need to do at this point, right? Just show up. Yeah, you show up. Sign the ups. Date. Save the date. I don't think we're doing any sign ups. It's just save the date and come. Um, we're gonna have a great band. The lights are gonna be back. Um, I think we're just gonna have a maybe a couple cool videos that we're gonna do or show. Um, Noah's gonna preach um, another awesome word on the topic of life in Jesus. Um, so just show up, 7 p.m. at Millington Baptist Church, Basking Ridge, New Jersey, August 16th. Love to see you there. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, all right, what else? Anything else? That's all I got. 
All right. Well, if that's all you got, that's all we got. Thanks for joining us for Behind the Pulpit today. Uh, we hope you have a wonderfully blessed week. Clint, thanks for being here. Thanks for we'll having me, We'll see you uh, at least next year, hopefully. PBS Dave, week. we'll see you later. Sounds good. Thanks, right. guys. God bless.